everybody. Welcome to another episode of the New York Her Podcast presented by Visa. So grateful to have everybody listening in once again this week. As usual, please listen, subscribe, share. We have a lot of meaningful conversations on this podcast, so I'd love it if everybody supported. You can listen to it on Spotify, Apple, Google, or NewYorkJets.com. If you want to check out the video, video is always cool. This week, I have a very special guest, and I know, I know I say that every week, but I think every woman that comes on this podcast has been very special. So without further ado, I would love to welcome in Fox sports reporter, Laura Oakman. Laura, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I so appreciate the conversation. Laura, you've been such a strong female presence within the sports industry since you graduated from the University of Kansas. What first and foremost made you so interested in going into sports broadcast? Um, it's funny. You'll get this. New Yorkers will get this. I'm a Chicagoan and, and we have kindred spirits in some way. And people used to always ask me and still do why sports and how'd you get into sports? And I'm always like in Chicago, sports wasn't gender. It wasn't like the boys went and watched the bears on Sundays and the girls went shopping. We all watched the bears together. We all either watched the Cubs or the White Sox together. And, and like New York, Chicago was a huge sports town. So sports was always part of me growing up. I never in a million years thought it would be part of my life um, in terms of a career, but I knew at a very young age that I wanted to be a storyteller. My mom told me that when I started writing stories and when I started interviewing people all the time, even though it was probably more called harassment then and, and, uh, and a bit of being nosy as a little girl, but she would always tell me she thought I would do something with writing and would always say, you're going to be a storyteller. And so when I went to KU, Journalism was my path. I already knew that. And I took a class late in, in life, late in uh, my senior year, that was sports journalism. I was the only the only girl. And I loved it. I, I realized really quickly of all the stories to tell, sports has the best. And, um, and it spoke to me the most, but also what was speaking louder to me was you can't do this for a living. There's only one of you in this class. It's hard enough to even go into journalism, but now try to go into sports journalism as a woman back then. So I, it, it was never encouraged. And I just got very lucky um, or blessed the way the universe works. And my first job in Montgomery, Alabama was news during the week and sports during the weekend. And that was a huge, huge deal in Alabama. But uh, I, I instantly knew that that was it. That was the calling. And, and I absolutely loved it. Um, found out very quickly there were a lot of challenges with it. But the second that I started talking sports and started being a part of that sports storing, that sports uh, telling universe, I loved it. You've quite literally been reporting on sports as your career since you graduated college. You've kind of done a little bit of everything, too. Like you mentioned, some of the small markets. You worked for CNN. You're currently with Fox Sports covering the NFL. What were some of the biggest differences you noticed in your career path from start until now? Me? The biggest difference was me. The biggest difference was confidence I had in myself. It was it was really hard. My, my first... My first welcome to sports as a woman moment was in Montgomery, Alabama, and it was my first Friday night football game. And coming from Chicago, Friday night football wasn't it wasn't the universe. It wasn't the biggest deal. And then moving to the South, I learned very quickly um, how huge Friday nights were. And I was doing my first game and it was a huge game and I was waiting for the high school coach to come meet me. And I was sitting there, Olivia, having a moment. And I know you know this moment. It's, it took me nine months to get my first job. And so I was sitting there having that great moment of you did it. You made it. You're making $10,500. Like this is a career now. Like yeah. look at you. Go. And I was sitting there having this wonderful moment. And all of a sudden the coach walked out with a couple of people and he was holding a football and the basketball. And I didn't think anything of it. I was too much enjoying my moment. And as he walked up and I went to awkwardly put my hand out, not sure which hand, how he was going to shake my hand. But the first thing he said was, little girl, I just wanted to make sure you knew the difference between a football and a basketball. And a basketball is round and a football is all blown. Oh, no. And everybody laughed. And I went from having a moment to all of a sudden um, just feeling dejected and feeling like I got punched in the stomach. And it went from I had made it to, oh, you haven't even started yet. And so 
that started my path where everything in my head was, you don't know what you're talking about. You have to prove, you know, what you're talking about. You don't belong. And I took that with me everywhere from small markets to Chicago to CNN sports. And then finally got older and more confident in myself and realized, hey, you know what you're talking about and you do belong and you're not good for a girl, you're good. So things changed how people view you and your assignments and the events you go to, all of that, you know, changes as you go up the ladder. But the biggest thing that changed was my confidence and when I had none of it and when I finally got a whole bunch of it. Confidence is an incredible point because when I think about when I first started as a professional sports broadcaster, my confidence level, and I, I'm only in my fourth professional year, but when I think about my first year compared to where I'm at now, leaps and bounds. And it's true. I think I think many, not just a lot of people in general, have had that moment where their confidence was so low, they didn't believe in themselves, because it's tough. It's a really tough industry. You know, you have to have thick skin. There's a constant crowd. There's constantly people analyzing everything you're doing, but confidence absolutely key and I can't even tell you how how much more confident I am in year four but it has to start really from within I think I really do think uh, that. I love that you said year four because I can't wait to talk to you at year 10 and year 20 and year 25 you know it just it keeps going and what I always say is this and and I did this before social media so I pray for you guys a lot um but what I would always say is at some point all the outside voices that you hear become your own voice so when you're told at 22 years old and 23 and 24 and 25 and 27, but when you're constantly told you don't belong, we don't want you and your voice doesn't matter and your voice doesn't mean anything and, and people are constantly questioning you, those voices eventually become yours. And especially at that young age, there's exceptions. I've been around some incredible women who've had that confidence from the start, um, but usually because they've done something else before they got into this business. But that was the hardest thing for me because I had to really do that work to make sure that my voice didn't sound like their voices, that my voice started becoming really positive and became my biggest cheerleader and became my biggest advocate. So that way, when everybody else was saying, you don't, you can't do this, you shouldn't do this, we don't want you to do this, my voice was going, you can do this, you're doing this and you're crushing this. But until that voice got louder, I had a really tough time because it was just my questions were longer than my answers because I wasn't going to ask you how the transition from a 3-4 to a 4-3 was. I was going to have to prove to you that I knew what the 3-4 was versus a 4-3. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, the player or coach would sit there and it's kind of like, let's go, let's go, let's get to the question. But my questions were simply a vehicle to show you I knew what I was talking about. And so as my confidence grew, my questions became better. My listening became better because suddenly I wasn't into my own head. I was into yours. And so for the first time ever, I could be present in an interview, in a conversation, because the old me, the young me, I had two dialogues going on. I had the one that was going on here that you and I are having right now. But then that one in my head was going bad answer or bad question. Mm -hmm. That's a stupid question you didn't phrase that right and so I wasn't even listening to what the person said because I was so in my own head and the only thing that changed um was confidence in myself and and that was the biggest game changer as a professional as a woman as a human being confidence is absolutely everything I think you really just pulled some of these thoughts straight out of my head <laughs> because <laughs> you you're sorry for getting in there. Sorry about that. But no, it's okay. It's fun, right? <laughs> yeah, your point resonated with me completely again because it's very true. I remember from my first year when oftentimes I found that I was struggling in interviews, it was because, like you said, those two conversations that were going on in your head. You're battling uh -huh. your own voice and trying to have the confidence in yourself that you can do it. And then you're also trying to muster up the courage to do an interview and make it sound like presentable and professional. And like you said, always wanting to prove that you know the game, you know the sport, and now you have to ask those good questions to prove it. So I, I completely understand the point that you're coming from. But I think everyone kind of has to experience that in this industry at some point, one point or another, to build that confidence and to bridge over into who you're supposed to be. And it's a constant journey. I mean, you know, you are, you've been doing this for over 20 years now. And Almost 
30. I mean, it's, I used to, I normally would say day that you downplayed it. So I'd sound younger, but (laughs) I'm now like, you give me every one of these years. I've earned these. I've almost 30 years. Almost 30 years, which actually brings up a great point. Did you ever envision yourself where you are at today when you first started? No. And and I'm going to guess you have this a little bit now too, but I just wasn't seeing older women. It was hard enough just finding a woman. And so it was more about just getting a gig and getting it, you know, getting a job. And I never thought about what, how to turn a job into a career because I wasn't watching longevity of women. And that's the biggest thing now, whenever I talk to young women, I always say, I want you guys, I get it. Look at the women who look like you, you know, look at your age, look at the women who have the jobs, you know, for you, look at all the team reporters and you're all around the same ages, around the same ages. But what I'll always say is, but start looking at the women who've really done this for a long time now, because thank God there are, you know, a good number now, not enough, but a good number. And what I'll always say is look at what they've done, because it went from I have I landed a sweet gig to how did I build a career in this business? And and I always kind of say my transition in life, once I got the confidence and I felt really good about myself and, and felt really you know, really cocky in terms of, Hey, I beat sexism, you know, like, look at, I've done this for a long time and I've proven myself not as a woman, as a journalist and as a sports broadcaster, not as a woman. But suddenly when I thought, okay, I, I beat sexism, ageism smacked me in the face. Mm-hmm. And that was a whole different conversation in my head and a whole nother rabbit hole to go down. And so I never, you know, in my 20s and a million years, I didn't think about what would it look like in this business in my 30s and my 40s and my 50s, because everybody was telling me I couldn't get in, period. So I never thought, how do I make it last? So I'm really proud of that. And and I jumped you by saying, you know, almost 30 years, but because I am really proud of that. I'm really proud that for so many years when I started, I looked around and I looked at your path and I looked at her path and I looked at her path and why are they getting those jobs and why am I not getting these jobs? And then one day I just looked around and was like, I'm here. Like I'm still here doing this. And it was one morning. I'll never forget this. I was in a hotel room on a Sunday morning. It was about three years ago. And I was getting ready for the game and my phone started blowing up. And that's very unusual. As you know, like your friends and family learn not to, not to reach out Sunday mornings. Mm. And my phone was blowing up and I looked and I had a tweet alert and it was, congratulations, you're the third longest tenured sideline reporter in NFL history. And so my phone started blowing up from, from people responding to that. Yeah. And my first reaction was to make an age joke and to, you know, kind of be self-deprecating. That's usually where I go yeah. or to diminish something. That's where a lot of women go. But I was so overwhelmed by it because all of a sudden I thought all these years I looked at other people's paths and, and suddenly I woke up to, uh, you know, to a barrage of tweets saying, you've been doing this for a really long time. And that was the greatest gift I could have ever received when I finally went, oh, not only are you doing this, but you've, you've been doing it and you're still doing it. And that was that was one of the biggest rewards I've ever got. What an incredible gift. Like you mentioned, just a, a gift probably that you didn't necessarily expect but thank, like you said though, thank God for women like you in this industry who are proving to other young women that we deserve a space. And not only do we deserve a space, but we deserve to stay in this space, especially when working hard. So yeah, it's, it's an incredible accomplishment. And now that you think about it, like you said, you've almost been doing it for 30 years. Do you ever envision yourself doing something else? I was like, please don't say 30 more. I get so nervous, like, <laughs> do I envision what? I'm doing a whole bunch of other things. And what I always say to people, I'm so grateful for my job. I'm so grateful for the NFL and Fox who, who kept me working for a long time. And so, you know, I can't say enough about how grateful I am and thankful I am um, about that. But what I will always tell, especially, you know, the young women that I coach and mentor Sideline reporting is this awesome side of mashed potatoes. I love mashed potatoes. Like I, I want to eat mashed potatoes all the time if I could, but it's not going to fill me. I need a good filet mignon to go with the mashed potatoes to mix it up. And so I, I've spent the last 10 years going, okay, what else am I doing? And what is my filet mignon? And 
I used to do everything from anchoring and hosting and reporting and sidelines and all of that, but my directions changed. And I started a company for women in sports and I started a production company and started produ producing my own shows. I started, um, I now have a communications company where I have clients who I'm helping them learn how to communicate. So what I would tell you is that I'm doing everything. I'm, I'm at that age because my mom was this age when she died. So I, I appreciate life and I appreciate getting older because I didn't get to watch a mom do that. And so I'm not one of those that goes, where do I want to be a year from now or five years from now? I go, what do I want to do right now? And I, I try really hard. If it's something I really want to do, I make sure that I'm working on that. So I don't know where I'll be three years from now because I can tell you if you would have asked me, you know, a year before I started a production company, would you want to do that? I'd go, I don't know how to do that. Or if you would have said, do you want to be a communications consultant? I would have said, I don't know. Or if you would have said, do you want to start a company for women? I would have said, I'm not a girl's girl. Why would I do that? I'm a guy's girl. So all these things I never saw coming have been the ride of my life and have been the greatest, you know, the greatest gifts in my life. And so I'm really, really cautious to ever say, what do I see down the road? Because I just pray that I'll be there down the road. Uh, like I know everyone does right now in 2020, but I just go, I, I pray I'm healthy. I pray I'm happy. And I pray I'm evolving in ways that I can't see right now as you and I are sitting here. Well, it's beautiful advice just for anybody, honestly, not just sports broadcasters, but really beautiful advice just to take and listen in and think about how precious life is. You touched on the fact about how you are helping young women in the sports broadcast industry. Your company Galvanize, very familiar with it. I'm curious, what first inspired you to help young women ease into the sports broadcast industry? It, it's again, if you would have asked young me, I would have said to you, I don't have many girlfriends. I certainly, I didn't in high school. I didn't in college. Um, like most of us in sports, we're guys, girls, and that's usually the world we're comfortable in. So I put myself in that and I didn't have any women mentors and I didn't have any women friends in this business. And not because I was, um, not because of cattiness, not because of competition, all those stereotypes, but because it's so hard and because you just kind of have your head down and you're working to make your own path. And I wasn't looking at a path alongside of me or behind me or in front of me to say, hey, can you help me? So I did this very much alone, like most of us do. And I got to an age where I started watching these young women get thrown into positions that I was like, oof, I'm glad I didn't get thrown in that quickly. I'm glad I didn't get thrown in that high, that fast. And I started watching them burn out and not even burn out. I watched them getting thrown out and I watched them make mistakes early as I would have done as well and watched places, get rid of them and bring the next one up and the next one up. And I'm really thankful that I got to watch that at an older age, because if I was younger, if I was your age, I would have been very resentful of the women because I would have been like, didn't belong, didn't do their work. You know, they shouldn't be here. You know, that's where my head was, my head was, but fortunately it happened when I was older and I had um, maternal instincts kick in. And instead of being judgmental of the women, I got really protective. And I said, okay, I can't change the system and I can't change how this is working. But what I can do is try to help it and try to help these young women. So even if they get opportunities that might be a little bit too big for them, there's somebody there that can help them navigate it. And and not just as a mentor, which that's a big role, and I take it very seriously, but I wanted to give them something I didn't have when I was floundering, which was a network of women. I wanted them to have somebody their same age. I wanted to have the, I wanted them to have somebody a little bit older. I wanted them to have a mentor. And so I started, you know, really thinking, how do I create a culture? How do I create a network of women who don't judge each other, who don't size each other up and don't look at each other as competition, but look at each other as allies? And that was a dozen years ago. So it's been it's been happening. And the first time I did a boot camp, I didn't know what it was. It wasn't called anything. I just was like, how can I help? And it was about 20 women who all wanted to be on camera. And it took about four months to get them, you know, to find 20 women who wanted to do it. And now about a dozen years later and over 2000 women later, um, we have women from all ages, all stages. And it started with women on camera. But now it's women behind the scenes, it's producers, it's directors, it's writers, it's PR, it's advertising, it's agents. We're, we're across the board galvanized, which is women in sports, period. And it's, uh, 
it's been awesome. It's again, I keep talking about gifts, but it's been one of the greatest gifts of my life. I'm very appreciative of the honesty you talking about, you know, if you grew up in the era that we did, you might look at women differently in, in sports broadcasting, just because like you said, it was head down constantly worrying about your own path, which is completely understandable. But like you said, times have changed very, very thankful. In my opinion, I think the industry has changed a lot in the fact that women are very supportive of one another. And, you know, like oftentimes in the past, there weren't a lot of spots for women. So I think it was a little bit more challenging because people looked at it more as a competition. But now everyone knows and feels like there's a, a seat at the table for everybody. So I think there's a lot more support just among women and among each other, which I think is needed, very much needed in this industry. Yeah. It, it's hard because there's so many more of us, which is awesome, but there's yes. not enough of us. It's there's true. more of us at a seat at the table, but we're not running the table yet. We're not running the rooms yet. And I think that's when we're going to really see the biggest difference in this business. Mm -hmm. Numbers is awesome. You know, there's so many more of us. I, back in the day, I, every big event I went to, every the first Super Bowls I went to or World Series or NBA Finals, I would count women because I could. And so it started on one hand and then it's, you know, went to two hands. And now the great news is I can't count anymore. You know, there's so many of us. But if I wanted to count executives and I wanted to count women in power, I'm back to one hand again. Yeah. So I always say like, we've come so far in numbers, but we have so much further to go in terms of truly making an impact in this industry. Well, like I already said, very grateful for women like you in this industry who are carving a path and helping other young women just smooth into this industry. Because like we talked about, it's not the easiest place, but once you get in, it's so rewarding it's incredibly fun. Laura, I also wanted to ask you, you've covered some very incredible events from Super Bowls to NBA Finals, World Series, Olympics. I'm so curious, what is one of your favorite events you've ever covered in sports? Uh, it's always so hard. Um, I'm going to give an answer that sort of does a little back channel, and I apologize for it, because... Okay. I mean, covering the Olympics is awesome. And I've done three of them and hosted three of them. And, and that's pretty magnificent. You know, there's a different sense of pride. There's a different sense of, I mean, you're allowed to root for the Jets. You know, I've never been able to root for a team. And you're there rooting for your country. And there's a, di there's a different feeling to that, which is really neat that you don't have to apologize or kind of quietly wear your fandom. You get to openly root for the Olympians, which is a really cool experience. And and the bigness of Olympics um, never is never lost on me. But last year I called my first Super Bowl and it was for Westwood One Radio and it was Kevin Harlan and Kurt Warner and Tony Vaselli. And um, to be doing it at this age, uh, it was pretty amazing. I, I, I'm done with bucket lists. Like I said, I kind of do it. You know, if I, if I want to, if I, if I'm going for something, I go for it. I don't have a, a wish list anymore. I try to make it my, what, what to do right now. So I had sort of said, I'm okay with never calling a Super Bowl. I've covered so many of them. And then all of a sudden standing on the field pregame and everybody getting kicked off and, you know, and all of a sudden looking around and going, Oh my God, like you're covering a Super Bowl. And, and I'm really thankful that it was at this age where I really, truly appreciated it. And I truly had the confidence to go, I belong at the Super Bowl. You know, that I'm not questioning it. I'm not questioning if anyone else deserved it or whoever else was doing it. I just was really happy that I had, that I was covering it and that I had earned it. Um, but that's the, that's the real answer um, in terms of events. But what I would say to you is, when I was a young reporter um, and I was covering NBA finals and as a Chicago girl, I traveled with the Bulls during the heyday for the second three-peat. So that was pretty amazing. But during that time, I met my best friend in the world, Stuart Scott. And Stuart had just, um, just gotten off of ESPN2 and I was in Chicago and just about to make my jump to CNN Sports, which was a big jump for me. And we had met and became best friends and we would travel and you know with the bulls and Stuart was a chicago guy yeah. and i just remember one time um we were sitting at a finals game and the game was going long and we were listening to a couple of the reporters next to us and they were stressing because the game was going long in deadlines and we all understand that but at that time as a young reporter 
as young reporters, we were stunned by that. And we were like, let's make a vow right now to always remember what we're doing and where we are. And we would literally, you know, hold our, our score sheets, you know, over our heads so we could be looking at each other and going, you know, during, during a Michael game, you know, during the flu game, during, you know, like having these moments. And we made a vow that we said, let's always make sure that while we're covering other people's moments, let's make sure we always take in ours. And so when I think back of, of all the things, all the big events that I've covered and small ones, I can't tell you scores. I'm bad at that. I, I can't tell you, um, I can't tell you stats. I'm horrible at that. But I can tell you every conversation that was meaningful that I had, especially if Stuart was involved. But same thing with games. If you asked me three years ago if I did a Jets game about whatever, you know, or playing whoever, I'd be like, I don't know. Did I do that game? But then I would look and go, oh, I had the greatest conversation, actually, with, you know, with this player back then. And I'll never forget those. So, so such a long answer. I apologize. But what I would tell you is, the big events, the small events, they're also meaningful if you make them that way. And so I'm very aware of the conversations I've had with players, with coaches, with friends, with Stuart. Um, that's that's what I think about. And when I play my highlight reel in my head, I very rarely see Michael Jordan making a shot. But I always, always, always see Stuart sitting next to me going, yeah. my God, you know, when Michael made something. So um, I think the older you get, that's probably everyone's answer in life. But that's the stuff that really means something now. That's what I really love about sports too, personally, is how much it just brings people together. And I know from my experience, my small experience so far in the four years that I've been in professional, I know some of my most memorable games, times haven't been, like you said, the big games or the big events. It's mainly been the really good conversations you've had with players or coaches, relationships I've built with coworkers. It's just, I, I agree. I think that that is one of the best parts of sports in general and doing this job. And what happens is it's, it's you know, the, the relationships you're building with the other reporters from all the teams. Yeah. And it's the same thing, you know, with us that we travel so much. So we have our own team where you build the relationships. But I can't wait. You know, it's the, I haven't been to the Jets in a really long time. And and I'm, you know, really excited when I saw I was doing a game because I haven't seen Jared Win- Winley in PR for a long time. Jared, yes, and, he's the best. <laughs> so, like, that was my first thought. It wasn't yeah. even about, you know, about – seeing coach Gase, who I've known for a really long time and excited to see him and don't get me started on Frank Gore, how much I love Frank and Joe Flacco, you know, like all these people I can't wait to see. But my first thought was I haven't seen Jared in a million years and I couldn't wait to call him and be like, how are you? So I think that's the stuff, you know, again, it's just, you're, it's exactly what you said. It's relationships are everything. And how blessed are we to have the backdrop of games in the middle of that, but I think what's in the forefront are the relationships you build, the people that you get to know, and then a really cool backdrop of an event going on behind that. Yeah. Uh, Really quickly before I let you go, Laura, actually your shirt really reminded me, and for those of you who are just listening and not actually watching, her shirt says, Woman Up, you recently made history as a woman in the NFL First time in ever NFL history during a game where there was a female reporter, a female official, and two female coaches on both sidelines. Can you even begin to describe what that day was like to me? No, I can't. You know, it's it, it's funny because so many of us have said this for so many years with every first, right? Like every time there's a woman first. And we always say the same thing, which is I can't wait for the day that it's not a story. But – it is a story. And so I was so excited and so thankful that the universe and the schedule makers lined it up that I was going to be a part of that. But I'll tell you what was the greatest thing for me was all week I got to talk to the coaches and to Sarah Thomas, the official. So to, to Callie and to Jennifer and to Sarah and, and, and talk to them on the phone and email and text and get to know each other. So by the time Sunday showed up, I felt like they were friends and each one came up and gave me a huge hug before and I, and, or six foot virtual, you know, one of those hugs. And to be able to, again, be able to talk to them about um, not just on camera, what I was saying, but to know how excited they were. And what was really neat for me was it's very galvanizing. 
none of them, when I first asked them, you know, how excited they were or how was this meaningful, none of them talked about themselves because they they're used to that. They're all trailblazers. So they've had first, but what was so cool for all three of them was they had never done something together like this. Mm -hmm. And so I was really nervous. What would happen is what happens often in historic games. You ask a player or a coach about it and they go, you know, now's not the time for reflection. You know, I'll think about this afterwards, but right now it's just a normal game. And so I'm so programmed that way. But what was really tremendous was all three of them were like, this is a moment and let's soak in the moment. And I was really, really happy for that because it allowed me to cover that story the same way. And I'm so thankful because the only thing, you know, that the only thing better or as great as women supporting women or great men who support women. And I'm yeah. so fortunate that I have a producer at the NFL and Fox named Mark Titleman. And Mark was all for that story. And my play-by-play -play guy, Kevin Kugler and analyst Chris Spielman are, are girl dads. And so all of them, my whole team and my director, who Greg Scopatoni, who was also a girl dad. So I had this group of men who understood the magnitude. And so I got to tell two stories on air and that might sound like nothing, but in an NFL broadcast to be able to talk about women making history twice in one game is huge. And so I'm so appreciative that um, that we had women who took in the moment and that I work with a group of men who were like, yeah, like, you know, let's do this moment right and not just let Laura talk for 10 seconds. So it, it just was such a privilege to be a part of it, a privilege and a pleasure oh. to be a part of it. I can't even imagine, honestly. I wish I was at that game. I, w I would have loved to just even be a fan in the stands and be a part of that. But I, I agree. It's incredibly, incredibly important to have support from not only women, but men too. So very, very grateful to hear that you had that on both sides. Laura Oakman, I cannot thank you enough for your time. I am so appreciative of it. The world can see how talented and kind you are. Thank you so much for joining me on another episode of the New Yorker podcast. Can't thank you enough. Thank you for having me. You are wonderful. I so appreciated this conversation, Olivia. Thank you. That's a wrap on another episode of the New York Her Podcast presented by Visa. Big thanks to everybody who's been listening and subscribing each and every week. The support is very much appreciated. And another huge thanks to Fox reporter Laura Oakman. Incredible to have her on. Again, everybody, share, subscribe, listen to it on any platform that you can. I appreciate the support, and I'll see you guys next week. <laughs>